welcome back to another episode of Women in STEM Wednesdays. Today's request actually came from a viewer last week. And so I want to open up the opportunity to all of you. If there's a favorite female scientist you have, please comment her name below on this video or go to my YouTube discussion panel and include her name there. And I'll try my best to get to all of our favorite female scientists to try to share their stories with the rest of the YouTube community. And I'll also try to coordinate a fun activity that goes along with her story. Today's female scientist that we're going to discuss is called Ada Lovelace. She virtually changed the world of computing, technology, and mathematics as we know it. If it wasn't for the work she did, a lot of things involving computer science and programming wouldn't be able to happen the way they do today. For that reason, she's known as the mother of computing. Before I get too deep into her story, I'm going to give you all a little background on computing and programming in case there's any terminology that you all might not be aware of. And after I'm done telling her story, I'm going to have a fun interactive activity that you all can do at home. So many of us have access to computers either at our homes or at schools or our libraries. And it's pretty easy to see how they've all impacted our lives, if not every single day. Computers allow us to create. Now we can create Word documents, write reports, edit images, create videos. There are so many things that computers let us do in terms of creation. They also let us do research. We have access to the World Wide Web where we can access millions of different media sources to get information we need for different daily activities. And also, one of the most important things computers do for us is they do complex calculations millions of calculations that we as humans could never have the capacity to do ourselves. And that's exactly what Otto Lovelace was all about. She believed that we could use computers to do what the human could not, and that they could essentially be an extension of human life if we just primed them with knowledge they need to solve these complexities. The way that Otto Lovelace believed that computers could solve these complex calculations was through programming. If you don't know what programming is, a computer program basically gives the computer an executable instruction of things to do. This can be performing calculations on a lot of data, manipulating data, bringing an image to your eyes, doing many different things. It's how a lot of the softwares we use today are written. Now programs are written by coding. Code is a list of instructions that we as humans give to the computer, but we do it in a way that the computer understands. We do this in letters and numbers that are recognized specifically by different coding languages. Some of these different languages include R, Python, Java. There's a variety of different languages that tell the computer to do things in different ways. Now a script is basically a full length of instructions for a program that has several lines of code. It's important that when we write scripts that we consider the order of different code that we give it. It has to follow a specific order. We have to make sure that all of our file names are spelled correctly. Some languages are case sensitive. And of course, we want to make sure that in this script, we designate what we want our output's name to be and where this output should be stored. I'm actually really excited about today's interactive activity. I am a software carpentries instructor. What that means is that I'm able to teach people different computing languages. For instance, I am an R instructor, and I do this according to Software Carpentry's lessons. If you want to learn how to code more on your own, please visit the Software Carpentry's website where you can find free lessons. So who was Otto Lovelace? A couple quick facts about this amazing female scientist is that to this day, she still has her own holiday in her honor in October, and she's credited with creating the first ever program, even though she never had a computer to run it on herself. Before we get carried away with today's interactive activity, let's look a little bit more into the story of Otto Lovelace. Again, I'm going to be reading this book called Women in Science by Rachel Ignatowski. So feel free to follow along if you haven't had this book at home. When Otto Lovelace first saw the difference machine, she became obsessed. The early computing pioneer Charles Babbage invented this gigantic gear-filled calculator. And after meeting him in 1833, Otto did everything she could to convince him to work with her. Otto's love affair with math started when she was very young. Her mother, Anne Isabella Milbank, 
nicknamed the Princess of Parallelograms, was a mathematician who wanted the right upbringing for her daughter. Anna's father was the famed poet Lord Byron. The wildness that made him an amazing poet also made Byron something of a lousy husband, which led Otta's mother to leave him after Otta was born. Her mother gave Otta an unusually strict mathematical education. Otta met Charles Babbage when she was 17 and a very persistent young woman. She begged him to let him take her on as a student, but he was much too busy thinking of his next mathematical breakthrough. So when Otto saw an article in a Swiss journal about his newest idea, the analytical engine, she saw her chance to impress him. The article was written in French, which Otto spoke. So she translated his paper into English and published it in 1843. But that wasn't all. She took her own notes, making it twice as long. This got Charles's attention, and their collaboration began. Anna imagined a world where computers did more than mere calculations, a world where they could write music and become extensions of human thought. She also designed a way to program the analytical machine, using punch cards with a stepwise sequence of rational numbers called Bornoulli numbers. This is recognized as the first computer program ever. Anna was a true visionary, and she remains an inspiration to this day. Her name has become a call to action and proof that women can accomplish great things in technology, computing, and programming. So now that you all know a little bit about Otto Lovelace, the amazing woman to develop the first computer program, let's learn how you can do a little bit of coding and programming on your own at home. I'm going to show you all how to do a couple things in R. So R is a wonderful programming language. It's free. It's online. If you go to CRAN, otherwise known as the Comprehensive R Archive Network, you can find free downloads for your Mac, Windows, or Linux. And there's also an online community of people who are more than Happy to answer any questions you might have, any problems that you have. And as you, as you can see on the left pane, you can also check out the manual for other guidelines and all sorts of things. So after you've downloaded R for whatever computer you might have, you can open it up. And I actually downloaded something called R Studio. R Studio. Our studio is sort of like a little bit more advanced version of just the traditional R software. As you can see here, R studio is very user friendly. You can actually drag and drop data sets into your environment. You can see plots essentially in the same area as your code is. It doesn't come up as a separate window. You also have your script pane right here, and then your actual console. So let's go ahead and get started sort of learning about what our studio is and how we can work with it. So the first thing you ever want to do whenever you're writing any code or doing any sorts of program building is you want to figure out what your directory is. And your directory is going to be the place on your local machine or your computer where you're going to store all of the data that you're going to be working with. So in R, one way we can find out where our current directory is, is to simply type the git wd and then parentheses command. And notice that I'm doing this in my script area instead of my console. I think this is just a good practice. That way you can save your script later and you'll know exactly what you did and it's easy to go back and change mistakes than if you already had it in the console and you didn't save any of it. So after I read it, in the little script pane, I'm going to do command return, and it actually is going to perform and execute that little command that I told it to. So it tells me where my directory is. I actually want to change this, though. As you can probably see, I have a bunch of files on my desktop, and I definitely need to clean it up. But I am going to go ahead and change my directory, which is set wd parentheses. And then in there, I'm going to take this basically anything in my Halley write directory and I'm going to change this to desktop and now you can see that this has select 
that this has successfully gone through. If you were to have an error or maybe a misspelling, for instance, if we were to maybe misspell desktop and try to execute this, we can see that an error will come up in red ink and it will tell us that the previous command was not able to be executed. Let's actually start working with some data. And so with our studio, we don't necessarily have to write our file names in our script and thus put them in the console because we actually have this nice, easy environment pane right here where we can directly import data. But for the sake of other R platforms, like the traditional non-studio platform, I'm still going to go ahead and show you a way to upload data into your R environment that might be on your local machine. So I'm going to just double check that my directory is set to what I want it to by doing command return and I have set my working directory. And now I'm going to read in a data file that I know is in this directory. And this file that I'm going to be reading in is a CSV file. If you don't know what that is, it's sort of like an Excel sheet, but it's saved as comma separated values. And so if you noticed in RStudio, sometimes if you start to type a function, it might give you lists already of commonly used functions. So this makes it nice and easy and you're able to avoid spelling errors. So after I have my function and my parentheses for my data file, I'm going to include quotation marks, and then I'm going to copy the name of this file. And the file I'm working with is called inflammation-2 CSV. And this data file is from a software carpentries lesson. As I mentioned earlier in this video, I am a structure for software and carpentries. So if you want to be able to learn more lessons, maybe not even in R, but something like Python, Git, or Unix, I, I will be sure to copy and paste their website below. They are free lessons, the whole community is full of free help, and I highly recommend it if you want to get involved with coding. So I'm going to command return, complete this command, and now we can see that it's read in this table. All this data is in this console. This would be the, where the column data is stored, and this is where the different row data is stored. But let's say I wanted to be fancy and import this through our studio's environment pane. I could click on import data set. I'm going to import this data as a text-based file, and I'm going to go, I know that this data is on my desktop. I'm going to click write inflammation. And here I can see inflammation too. And here I can see this file and it's going to nice and neatly take all of these comma separated values and formulate it into a data frame. So these are going to be the columns and these are going to be the row data over here. And you can go through and you can change any of these parameters if you want, but I'm just gonna import it like this. And as you can see, all of my data is right here in this sheet. Now let's say that you might not have a data set you want to work with just yet, or you want to know just some of the basic things you can do in R. Well, we don't have to have data. We can actually store things in what we call a variable. So I am going to go back to my script right here, and I am going to make a data set called numbers. All I have to do is write numbers, and then I will use a caret symbol and a little dash. And then I'm going to put C for combine this data set as a list. And so I'm just going to write a few numbers. Let's just do two, four, six, eight. And then we're going to do command return. So this list of numbers is going to be stored as variable numbers. Now I'm going to perform a few different mathematical functions with this number set right here since a lot of times whenever we're using R we're using it to analyze number data. I'm going to do 2 times numbers and here you can see the output is the answer 4, 8, 12, 16. So if we want to go back and check the math of this computer, we can see that it's correct. 2 times 2 is 4, 4 times 2 is 8, etc. 
So we can also learn different things about this data set. Let's figure out what the maximum number of this data set is. I know we only have four numbers and it's probably pretty obvious to us that the number eight is the maximum number, but let's say we had a huge long list of numbers. There were thousands of different numbers in this list and we wanted to know what the maximum value was. Again, I'm going to store something as a variable and I'm going to write max, I'm going to have caret dash, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to use max, which is a function, as you can see right here. And in parentheses, I'm going to write numbers. This was the data set we previously defined. I'm going to do command. And as we can see, it doesn't, in, it doesn't output exactly what the maximum is. That's because all we did was simply assign the value max as to the maximum value of numbers. But if we go back and just write max, it should print out the maximum number, which it does. We can do the same thing for min, min, and you can actually use the equal sign. I prefer to do caret dash, min, caret dash, min, numbers. And then we can write min and enter, and it will output the smallest number. We can also do mean or the average. So I'm going to do mean, caret dash, mean parentheses number. And if we write mean, we can print the value, which is 5. I hope you all enjoyed learning a little bit about coding and Otto Lovelace's story. Until next week, please feel free to hit the subscribe button below so that you can stay updated on everything on my channel.